Lord, we do thank you, God, that you are great and greatly to be praised and you have done wonderful things. Thank you for loving us and saving us. Thank you, Lord, for changing us from the inside out. And God, as we dive into your word this morning, would you open our hearts to receive all that you have for us? Holy Spirit, open our ears to hear what you are saying. We may walk forward, Lord, in victory and know you better and walk with you relationally. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. You're going to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 7. The title of this morning's message is that the struggle is real. We're dealing with the struggle against sin or with sin that we all face. You know, whether you have walked with God for a day or it's been decades, you have faced the challenges and the struggle that happens against sin. There's times when you can be so discouraged in your walk that you wonder whether you're even a Christian. Sometimes we come into things and we think, okay, now I've accepted Jesus, then everything's going to change from here on out, and, and uh, I'm not going to do those things that I did before. I'm not going to have to deal with those issues. They're completely gone, uh, and all of a sudden we find over, as the days go on, that, well, the, the memories are still there, and the issues still haunt you, and the things that you struggled with, they're not gone, in a sense, for good. They're, they're still hanging around, and all of a sudden, the, the doubts and the fears, and you start going, am I, am I even a Christian at all? I thought these things were to be gone for good. And some of you know exactly how that is. I mean, daily, it's a struggle. Everything from the thought life to, you know, the, the past things to maybe you're even dealing with some of the consequences to your actions, and, and you're going, wait a second, I'm a new creation in Christ. Why do I still deal with these things? Because you're still in the flesh. That's why. And it still is a challenge. Paul has told us here in Romans 7, he's getting us to understand what it means to have freedom in Christ and how it changes life. We talked about it last week that at the beginning of this chapter, he says, hey, a, a new relationship is made. You are no longer bound to the law. You've been set free by Jesus. And then he talks about not only is this, this new relationship made, but how we operate in this new relationship is different than how we did before. That we have a new way of dealing with things. We can't do it like the old way. It's a relationship we have with Christ. And then we got into the, there's a new reason that we understand, that as we look at God's law, we understand it's good, but yet it's convicting, huh? It points out that I'm a sinner. It shows me my sin. It sentences that sin to the cross, in a sense, that, to a death sentence, and it points me to the Savior. That really, God's word makes sense in the big picture. Everything makes sense in light of who Jesus is because he's the goal to get to. And now we see this last section, verses 15 to 25, where Paul talks about the struggle, the real struggle that we all face. That yeah, you're, till the day you meet Christ face to face, you are gonna have a battle against the flesh, against sin. But there's a solution in the midst of it that we have to hang on to and we have to look at. So let's go ahead and read the, our section of Scripture, verse, verses 15 to 25, and then we'll kind of pick some things apart. Romans chapter 7. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, 
but with the flesh, the law of sin. Some have thought that Paul is referring here to the time when he didn't know Christ. He was a very religious man. He was called the Pharisee of Pharisees, top of his class, top dog, very zealous. Thought maybe he was referring to that time when he struggled with pleasing God, and yet he knew inwardly there were things happening, as we all do, that weren't right. Some have thought, well, maybe this is Paul when he first initially got saved, and he's now trying to reconcile with how does the new life work compared to everything I've been through in the old life. And still others have thought, here is this Paul, and Paul at this time is a mature Christian, and he's simply recounting the struggle that we all face, even as mature believers, with battling the flesh. And I would say any of them work, in a sense, because Paul's main point here is that the flesh cannot please God. Whether you're saved or not, the flesh cannot please God. And so yet, when you come to Christ, you're a new creation, you're a new person, and the reality is that sometimes you still deal and struggle with issues that you've had before Christ. Listen, God offers forgiveness, but that doesn't mean that all the consequences are removed. If you committed murder, and you ended up in prison, and you came to know Christ, it doesn't mean that you don't have a sentence to serve. And so too, in your own walk with God, you are a new person. You may have struggled with anger, and the day you came to Christ, it was one of those issues to let go. But for another guy, it's that anger issue that he just struggles with day in and day out. He knows he's saved, but that anger issue is still chomping at the bit. The, the things that you've seen, whether it's lust or violence or whatever it is, it can haunt you even as a believer as you're trying to go forward in your walk with God. The battle with covetousness, the battle with greed, the battle with envy, all that stuff that kind of scarred you and shaped you in life before Christ is now become the battlefield of your life in Christ now. And so you're not weird for struggling with that. You're not a lesser degree of a Christian because, man, I, why can't I get over this issue? The Lord has left that issue there for you to call upon him to gain strength and back to his word, to trust him in going forward that you might experience victory. It's definitely something we need. How do I win this fight, though, with the flesh that I've got to deal with on a daily basis? Well, the first key is to recognize it's not me. It's not in me. I can't do it. Let's go back and, and let's kind of pick this apart. Chapter 7, verse 15, and look at the struggle and look at the Savior. For what I am doing, he says, I do not understand. For what I will to do that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. This is the perfect verse for dieters. I want to, but I can't. I have to confess to you that for many decades... I have been a Dr. Pepperaholic. I blame my father because that's what you're supposed to do, right? I see that hand back there, sir. I would pray for you too. I remember, I mean, 32 ounces is no big deal. And this, this has gone on for years, for decades, daily. Dentist says, you can't do that, man. Your teeth are going to fall out. I know it's not good for me, but my flesh, poof, there's something about that carbonated prune juice, as they call it. 23 flavors, you know, that's all. But there have been a few times where I have, I have been able to push it aside. Uh, I'd go on a mission trip for two weeks and I just couldn't get it. And so I just had to deal with the headaches and deal with the struggle that's there because it was unavailable. But I experienced something about uh, four weeks ago. Uh, I was sick in Mexico, and I couldn't get it. You didn't want it. And I thought, what a great time to kind of go cold turkey and kick this habit. And I got to tell you, I'm, uh, it's been a month, and this is the longest ever in my life that I haven't had soda. Don't clap yet, because I'm not done. <laughs> Anybody got any Dr. Pepper? <laughs> but I, I realized this. Um, I know my flesh. 
And I, I, I know its tendencies. And there's a good chance that I'll probably fail. Oh, you think, oh man, you need to be more positive. You need to be, you don't have such a defeatist attitude. No, I got the gift of reality. I know my flesh. And I know, I, my daughter had one the other day. I said, just, just give me a taste. I tasted it. I was like, oh, man, this is chemically, this is bad. But I still know my flesh, right? And you know your flesh. Because it's, it's not a new rodeo. I've been down this road before, whether it's two weeks, three days, four days. Maybe I'll conquer it. Maybe I won't. But I'll tell you what. Well, here's what I know. Jesus still loves me. And I may battle with it till the day I die. But when I get to heaven, he's probably got one waiting for me. Right? You know, it's just the reality that we look at in life. We go, you know, the things I don't want to do. I know my flesh. We all do things that we shouldn't do. We know that. But that's the nature of the flesh. We're not going to get on each other's cases because, oh my goodness, how come you have that and I have this and this, that? No. Here's the reality. Your flesh stinks. And it's bent towards sin. And you and I are going to struggle with it till the day we die. But we can relate to that spiritually. You know, we, we hear that voice in our head after something and we think, what are you doing, Jesse? How come you don't read more? How come you don't pray more? How come you don't witness more? Come on, man. Christ changed your life. You should be witnessing more. And we go, oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe I don't have it together. We all go through those same things. I can tell you what's wrong with me because I can tell what's wrong with you. And that is this, sin still lies within, right? It's still there. You might want to deny it. You might want to not recognize it. But I'll tell you what, you throw cold water in someone's face and there's a person that comes alive in there, right? And I found this then, and Paul recognizes this, that sin is going to do two, do two things in your life. Number one, um, it's going to cause, it's going to stir up confusion. Look at what he says in verse 15. What I am doing, I do not understand. I'm just baffled and bewildered by sin and how it can just foul up my whole relationship with God. I don't understand what God wants me to do because sin is getting in the way and it's causing me to make excuses for certain things and neglect other things and throw on rules and new things that I can't bear up. And it's just, it causes you no peace and no rest, just confusion. The second thing sin does, as Paul recognizes here, is it causes condemnation. What I will to do that I do not practice, which means continually, habitually practice. But what I hate, that I do. He's not saying, well, the things I don't care for, that's what I do. Or the things I, you know, you know, not a big deal, that's what I do. He says, the things that I detest and I loathe, I find myself doing. The struggle, the battle, sin condemns. You see, I've had times where I've said, Lord, I'm going to get up early because I just want to show you how serious I am. And so, hey, I am up. At four in the morning, some of you are like, man, I've had lunch by that time. No, I'm serious. For me, that's super early. And I'll, oh, I'm doing this, Lord. I'm going to spend hours just in the Word and in prayer. And this is going to turn out great. And the Lord just kind of, I imagine he just chuckles and says, go for it. First day, it's great. I'm feeling good. A little pumped about myself. A little tired, but I'm pumped. Second day, I'm good. By the end of the week, I'm sleeping in. And uh, you know how that feels. And then here comes the voice. The voice is, hey, dude, what's wrong with you? Jesus rose from the dead and you can't even get out of bed. Oh, that's right. And you just feel so defeated because you haven't lift up, lived up to this super Christian mentality that, oh, God's not going to work until I'm spending 26 hours a day in prayer and 48 hours a day and reading the word and whatever. Oh, it's all on my shoulders. You don't understand. You're missing out on the relationship that God wants with you. We heap condemnation on ourselves. And I can tell you, man, I have done that time and time again. Listen, I remember as a kid, I remember that when the Suns, Phoenix Suns lost, it was because of me. <laughs> You're thinking, man, that guy is messed up. Listen, I remember in such condemnation, in 93, when we lost the championship, it was because of me. It wasn't because Michael Jordan was so cool. It was because Jesse Claycamp blew it big time in some way, and that's the result. I mean, I, the whole world revolving around my sin. Condemnation, condemnation. 
That's the kind of stuff that we heap upon ourselves because that's what sin does. I didn't understand the relationship. There's a battle with sin, and it's the part that we all know, that we can love God with all our heart. We can say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to be like you. Do your work, Lord. And on the same sentence, as we take a breath, the flesh stirs up and says, oh, yeah, watch this. The old nature is selfish, and the fleshly desires stir up and say, oh, yeah, how about that rumor? Who? Who? Really? Who? How about that issue? Greed? Lust? Covetousness? Whatever it might be. It just starts, springs up, and you go, wait a second. Man, I was just having a great time worshiping God. Where did you come from? Get out of here. <laughs> That's how we feel, but the struggle is just, it's real. So there's this will to obey God, but in the disobedience, we realize we fail. Because we cannot please God in the flesh. The flesh is bent and sold towards sin. We cannot do it. What happens in our flesh is we either end up frustrated by what we can't do and just burn out and giving up, or we end up filled with pride and selfishness because look what I did. Everybody give me a pat on the back. 3 a.m. My part according to the Bible, is to make a choice to die to sin, to daily crucify it, to put on the new man, to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, and to go forward with grace and forgiveness. But when I fail in that disobedient act, there is a fact that is revealed to me. Verse 16 tells me that if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. You see, when I don't do what I'm supposed to do, when I do that sin, I'm simply saying the law is good. It shows that I am a sinner. And I've got to come to grips with it. Verse 17. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paul is separating himself. I, the Saul of Tarsus, from I, Paul, the apostle. There is a separation that he declares there. The sin, I really desire to obey God, but the sin in me is bent on disobeying God, and that's the struggle that we all know so well. Verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. Two questions to consider. Number one, what do you know about yourself? You've been with yourself quite a long time now. What have you learned? What have you learned? Paul says in verse 18, uh, for I know that in me nothing good dwells. We may know theologically that, but do we know it practically? We beat ourselves up for not being good enough, for not performing well, and the Lord says, hey, look, I already told you there's nothing good in you. That's why I came to die for you. And that reality when we come to grips, man, there is nothing good in me. It can be such a freeing moment because then I can enjoy the grace and mercy that God has for me. But as long as I'm still striving in the flesh to prove to God how good I am, how much he should love me, I'm missing it. It's just a work of the flesh. And it's going to disappoint me down the road. At times, I think it's good to, to, to take a step back and examine and assess your own life. What's going on? And we come to this reality, and hopefully you've come to it before. Man, I am such a mess without Jesus. I really am. You don't want to be around me. Because I'm some, probably going to hurt you and myself in the process. Y you realize that because you know your own flesh. I mean, check it out. Wednesday night, we are talking about battles. We're talking about battles. And anytime you talk about battles, uh, you know God's got to take you through it. And so instead of doing a six-week series on battles, I limited it to two weeks. Wisen up. So I just finished the last one. I'm taking my son home. And uh, it's a little later at night. And... He says, Dad, I'm hungry, and we had already planned on getting something to eat. And so by our house is this Taco Bell, and I get in line, and this is the worst Taco Bell in the world. I guarantee you that, because not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, at least four, maybe five times, not only has my order been missed, but I sat in the drive-thru at one point for a half an hour. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I said, I'm never going back to that Taco Bell. 
But what does the flesh do? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe this time will be different. So I get up and I pull up. I'm tired as it is. It's after nine o'clock. And I put in the order and I sit there. And I sit there. And I sit there for five minutes at the little box. Five cars in front of me. I said, I, I can't deal with this anymore. I am done. I am done. And I get hangry. You know, you know what that is? I get hangry as things go on. And so I said, Jack, forget this. We're going to McDonald's. It's right there. And so I, we race over to McDonald's and I'm thinking, there's no one in here. I get up to there. And I'm like, cheeseburger fries. And I look and this lady is the only one doing the drive through and both registers. There's a line of car. I'm like, oh no. Here I go again. So I start timing it. Sorry, that's just me. <laughs> 10 minutes later, cheeseburger and fries. And I'm just dying at this point. I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? He says, hey, you just preached on battles. I'm giving you one to go through. <laughs> Man, that's not fair. I didn't ask for that. It's supposed to be nice and easy. But guaranteed, the struggle that you face is going to be there. What do you know about yourself? Man, nothing good dwells in me. C.S. Lewis said, no man knows how bad he is until he has tried to be good. It's how true that is. The second question he says there in verse 18 is, how are you going to make those needed changes? That's what I'd ask you. How to perform what is good, I do not find. Ha, huh, let's come to grips right there. I can't do this. I can't fix myself. I, I, I can't. I don't have any power within me to change myself because the law doesn't give me any power and I don't have that ability. And so there's this reality check. I can't fix myself. I'm helpless. And that's a good place to be before God. To have that reality check that I need him to help me. Look at verse 20 through 23. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. See, Paul, again, painting this struggle, he goes back and forth, he says, I will, but sin does. I want to do good, but evil is present within me. I delight in the law of God, but the law is another law that overpowers me and captivates me into sin, the law of sin. And we're all in that same place. Man, I want to be sold out for Jesus because he's done so much for me. But this stinking flesh, man, it so trips me up. All at once is everything contrary to the Lord. And the battle is real. But so you're not in despair. Let me tell you this. Your struggle is a good sign. Here's why. Number one, it shows that there is conviction in your life. It shows that there's conviction. Why do I say that? Because when you're no longer convicted and when the sin no longer stings and when you've gotten to a place where you say, oh, well, that's just who I am, that's where the danger is. But when you've blown it and you feel that poke in the side and the Holy Spirit's saying, what are you doing? It's a good sign. You belong in the family of God. But let me tell you this, it's not okay to make peace with your sin. It's not okay to get to a place where you just say, you know what, that's just who I am. Oh well. No, no, no. God wants you to be victorious. And you may battle with it and face it, and you may fall a thousand times, but the righteous man gets back up and says, Lord, I still want victory. I still want victory, because that's what you want for me. The conviction must lead to the confession where I say, Lord, I recognize who I am. I'm a sinner, and I recognize who you are. You're the Savior. But that's not only a sign. It's a good sign when you have this struggle because one, that shows there's conviction. You belong to the Lord. Number two, it shows you of maturity. You ever realize that everything that grows has a struggle? And I've realized this, that, that as I grow in the Lord, as I mature in Christ, I'm more aware of my sinfulness. That's a biblical thing. Here's what we find Paul saying. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. Five years later, in Ephesians 3, 8, he says, I'm the least of all the saints. And then at the end of his life, in 1 Timothy 1, 15, he says, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. Paul, you're having a little pity party. No, I just realized that the longer I walk with Christ, 
I so need his mercy more and more. Amen. I just, I, I need it. He's still working on me. But I've realized this, not only, it's, it's a sign of maturity. I'm, no, I'm not only aware of my sin, but check it out. I am more focused on his faithfulness. That is what I realize. As you grow in the Lord, your sin gets higher, but the Lord gets even higher. How faithful he is to me when I'm a knucklehead. Man, I would have given up on me a long time ago and kicked me to the curb and said, don't come back. That's not my Jesus. And so I can say, you know, he's faithful to complete the work that he's begun. That he's faithful to guard you and keep you from the enemy, from the evil one. That when you're faithless, he's still faithful. Who does that? Our Jesus does. And that's what makes it such a beautiful thing that if he sees me that way, he wants me to walk in victory, I want to walk in victory. I want all that he's got for me. So the struggle is real and the signs point to that are good, that I'm growing in Christ by having those struggles. Having been real about the struggles, he now points us to Jesus, the solution to it all. Here, look at verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am. Amen. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Here is the heartfelt cry of the, in a sense, the defeated and desperate man struggling with sin who's so sick of it, so tired of it, so beat up by it that just is in absolute surrender. Says, I am a wretched man. And by wretched, we don't use that word. We don't walk around, dude, you, you're kind of wretched today. What are you talking about? Wretched, foul, disgusting, disturbing, a horrifying sight is how he views it. I'm a wretched man, and I'm strapped to this body of death. And in the Roman culture, when someone committed a, a murder, like first-degree murder, part of the crime is they take the body and they tie it to the living guy who did it. And guess what happens? The stench you bear, the, the decaying gets in you. It's not a pretty picture. Paul says, that's how it is, man. I'm strapped to this body of death. It's sin. It's ugly. How do you view sin in your life? Do you hate it? Do you loathe it? Do you look at it and go, man, you are, this just stinks. It's a horrifying thing. Or have you painted it nice and pretty and said, well, it is what it is. Listen, you that are parents, when your kids have pooped their pants, you are aggressive and serious about changing that diaper. <laughs> because it reeks. It is not only affecting my little jewel, my little buddy, but it's affecting me now. And it will affect the rest of it. You know, if you don't change, you might say, well, you know what? What's the big deal changing the diaper? They're going to do it again. <laughs> Dude, something's wrong in your thinking there. We need to have a conversation. It's unhealthy. It's bad parenting. And yet sometimes we can take that approach to go, you know, it's just the flesh. It stinks. It's going to happen again. So what's the big deal trying to deal with it? No. That's not what the Lord intended. You deal with it. You deal with it rightly. You confess that sin to the Lord. You get back up on your feet. You come back into fellowship. You start cultivating your relationship with the Lord and you find yourself going forward from it and not sitting back continually condemning yourself because, oh, I failed again. You realize the Lord knows how many times you're going to fail him and he still bought you, still wanted you. He sees your whole file, your whole history. It's shocking to you, not shocking to him. There's that part that thinks that, well, something good does dwell within me. No, nothing does. But how great the Lord is. Notice what Paul says in verse 24, or 25, I'm sorry, 24, throwing you around here. Who will deliver me from this body of death? You notice he doesn't say what? He says, who? Seven, chapter 7, verse 18, he says, it, it was, how do I do it? And here it's finally, who's going to do it? And I think this is absolutely huge. Why? Because Paul, for 23 times, is in verse 15 through 25, 23 times you see this letter, this person, I. I, 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 I. You can count them. It is a picture of when we are so focused on self, where we end up in frustration, and defeated, wretchedness, despair, weariness with who I am and what I've done until we come to that place where we see it's about who, not what. 
And I think maybe we have to consider that in light of lots of things. It's not a policy. It's not a program. It's a person that is going to change things. It's not looking at things and going, what do I need to fix my family and to fix myself? And what kind of thing do I need to do? And this, that, and the other. No, no, no. It's a who. It's who you need. You need more of Jesus. Well, I know he died for my sins. No, you need more of him. It's more than just what he's done. It's what he's doing. Even now, as he seeks to work in your life. Peter said in Acts 4, 12, there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved than Jesus. So he's a solution. And we get to that place where we cry out to him, who? Jesus is who. In verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. When Jesus comes into view, you go from the wretchedness and despair into life and joy and thankfulness. I thank God. Through Jesus, I can have victory. You see, Jesus didn't promise that the battle wouldn't be there. He promised he'd give you victory by leaning on him. And when you come to Christ, he's not saying, okay, everything's nice and neat now. It's going to be so easy. Bed of roses, unicorn frappuccinos all the way around. It's all good. He says, check it out, man. The struggle's still real. But I have given you victory, and I've promised you victory. He told his disciples in the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. The choice still has to be made. And he says there in verse 25, so then, which is kind of the conclusion of verse 15 to 24, in a sense, so then, I can serve God with the mind, I can serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I can say, Lord, you know what? Renew my mind according to your word. Uh, work in my mind. I want to set my mind to things above. I want my spirit renewed. You're changing me daily. God, you are made me a new person but yet at the same time, I can say, Lord, I am no longer going to let the flesh kidnap me, so to speak. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not going to try to make the flesh better. It has one place to go, and that is to the cross. I don't need to, to make it look better. Man, listen, the flesh is like a pig. You can dress it up, paint it up, make it look pretty, put a gold ring in its mouth, mouth and snout, but given the opportunity, it's heading back to the mud. What's wrong with you, flesh? You look good now. I still want mud. And so we come to the realization, have you come to that place? We say, you know what, my flesh, it ain't gonna wanna serve God ever. No matter what I dangle in front of it, it ain't gonna do it. But I know where it needs to go. So I take my flesh and I say, Lord, I'm bringing it before you. And you told me if I wanna follow after you, I've gotta deny myself, deny that flesh. And take it to the cross, we're going to crucify it there. Galatians 5, 24, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I know, Lord, my flesh got a big mouth. It's a slow death. It still wants to influence me. So help me, Lord, in the moment when the flesh is rising up to say, Lord, help me to walk in newness of life. And I want to live in the Spirit. I want to walk in the Spirit. And so I want to cultivate that relationship with the Lord. And I'll tell you what, the more you enjoy that relationship you have with the Lord, the more these theological things become practical things, daily things. And you're finding the Lord give you victory as the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. I want to close out with this quote from uh, David Guzik, great commentary. He said this, you thought the problem was that you didn't know what to do to save yourself. But the law came as a teacher, taught you all what to do, and you couldn't do it. You don't need a teacher. You need a savior. You thought the problem was that you weren't motivated enough. But the law came in like a coach to encourage you on what you needed to do, and you still didn't do it. You don't need a coach or a motivational speaker. You need a savior. You thought the problem was that you didn't know yourself enough, but the law came in like a doctor and perfectly diagnosed your sin problem, but it couldn't heal you. You don't need a doctor. You need a Savior. And isn't that true for all of us? We need a Savior. 
My prayer this morning is that as you, as you leave from here that you have recognized not only who the Savior is but your need for the Savior. Whether you've known the Lord for decades or just simply maybe for the first time this morning and surrender to the Lord. You need a Savior. I need a Savior. I need him on a daily basis because I know that in me nothing good dwells. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. You know the struggles that we face. At times we are so overcome and defeated. At times we are just weary and exhausted. Maybe even other times we've just won, so to speak, the battle. It's a joy. But Lord, you know us through and through. Lord, there may be some here this morning that have never surrendered their heart to you. They never asked you to be Lord and Savior. They're trying to put a pretty picture on their own flesh and prove themselves to you. And Lord, you've been calling out to them maybe for some time now to say, stop. The cross is sufficient. I died for all that junk. Stop trying. And if that's you here this morning and you've never made that decision to accept Christ as your Savior, while the heads are bowed, I just want to give you that opportunity. Just lift your hand up to the Lord. I want to lead you in a prayer. You've never made that decision. I know many of us have, but I want to give you that, that opportunity right now. Maybe you're watching by the web. If that's in your heart, then you just pray this prayer and say, Father in heaven, please forgive me of my sin. I believe in who you are and you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins that I might have eternal life. Come into my heart, make me a brand new person and give me the hope of heaven itself and I will praise you and thank you. <coughs> now I want to ask you who are believers, you know Christ, but maybe even this morning you came to church and you're in a battle. You're in a struggle with your flesh. And you feel a little defeated, you feel a little down and out, discouraged in your walk. I'm gonna pray for you. But I'm gonna ask you simply just slip your hand up to the Lord. And I wanna pray for you, okay? Anybody else, all right? Anybody else, lots of hands. Hey, this is real. This is how it goes. We've all been there at one time or another. All right. Lord Jesus, you know the hands up, you know the hearts that are broken. You said in your word, a broken and contrite spirit you would not despise, that you are near to the brokenhearted, Lord. And this is a good thing to be broken. As we talked about, Lord, the sign is good. The conviction is good. The maturing is taking place. We lean upon you, Lord. I pray for my brothers and sisters that are in that place, that you would just fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. You would comfort them, Lord, from all the condemnation they've heaped upon themselves, that you just cleanse it out, they confess it to you, that you give them a fresh start, that you lead them forward in victory, and Lord, even when the flesh rises up, that they lean to you and look to you. Thank you, Lord, that you love us far greater than our sin, and thank you for the cross. You've given us victory. Lord, would you lead them forth in your peace? Would you encourage them in their heart? Would you fill them with your Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name, amen.